talk about, I've studied a lot about this issue of anger. I've always been intrigued. Um, because I am a firm believer that God has given us every emotion that we have. You know that? Every emotion that you express, God has given to us. But what happens to it is what makes it sin. Okay? So anger in and of itself is not sin. Now look at Ephesians 4.26. Ephesians 4.26, and actually I'm going to go to Ephesians 4.25. It says in Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. I don't know if there's any emotion that will give the devil a foothold in anger. And you know what that's all about. When you hold it in, when you don't have to deal with it, and it creates resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness. And that's a pretty dangerous thing. But you look at the world today, how much anger do you see? You see quite a bit of anger. I mean, you just look at the news, and you're going to see it. You know, how many times do we see shootings and violent crimes? You know, you see uh, murder, suicide. You see road rage. Anybody ever done road rage before, been angry at somebody on the road or have had that happen? Did you know there's a study that indicates that, um, there's a study that indicates that within, since 2005, people's reports of road rage has doubled. All right? Um, all you have to do is look at domestic violence that's on the, on the uptick. A lot of that has to do with anger. Depression and anxiety is probably a manifestation of, of an excessive amount of anger. And of course, how many of you do video games and media? And, and you see it all over the place. And so I think the devil's getting a foothold, isn't he? In, in this whole idea. Now, God gave it to us. So we're going to look at it just as a, as a whole here and, and look at what we can do to overcome it by standing calm. All right, first thing we want to look at is some of the causes. I mean, I've listed five causes now, it could all be broken down, but some of this I uh, want us to understand is pretty deep. All right, it goes deeper than just, I got mad because somebody stole my wallet. All right, so really the first cause I want to talk about is injustice. There's plenty of injustice in the world, and if you ever look at what Jesus, how Jesus became angry, it has always been about injustice, hasn't it? It's always been that somebody else was being taken advantage of. Now, can anybody tell me any instance where Jesus got angry for personal attacks? Where somebody offended him? Somebody, you know, attacked him, and he got angry. Somebody called him a name, and he got angry. You don't see it. So injustice, I think, you know, Jesus got angry. God gets anger, but he does not. There is no sin. So I think it's okay to get angry at injustice, right? You get angry at sin, you get angry at the, the enemy, and, and that's kind of healthy for us. The second thing is expectations. Now, each one of us has expectations, right? When those expectations are frustrated, what tends to happen? You get frustrated, you know? Like if you're working a whole week and then you don't get a paycheck, what happens to you if you don't get that paycheck? You get just a little frustrated. And what if that frustration continues to go on? You get more and more angry. So expectations is important. When you deal with marriages and relationships, what do you expect the other person to do if they do not carry through with it creates a little bit of frustration, doesn't it? So expectations is important. I like this little formula. You know the level of expectation, the level of frustration that you have is dependent on three things. And you can write this down. The level of frustration Depends on three things. One, the importance of a goal that you're going after. All right, whatever the goal that you are achieving, you add that to the size of the obstacle that is in your way. Plus, the length or duration that that obstacle is in play will equal the level of our frustration. So in other words, anger will go up. Frustration goes up when the importance of a particular goal is being thwarted plus the size of the obstacle that, you, that gets in your way, plus the duration of that obstacle. In other words, here's what, how it works. If you don't get a paycheck at the end of your uh, end of the week, that is a, a frustration because the importance is I need that check to pay my bills. And if 
it, if it if the, it's a boss that I don't want to confront, the size of the obstacle is pretty good. It's pretty big. Plus, in the duration of the obstacle, the more that he withholds that check, the more the level of frustration goes up, doesn't it? So expectations, is, it's really important to check in, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Number three. That's sort of like an adjust suit. Yes. Check, yes. Right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that's going to create expectations. All right, number three is woundedness. Sometimes we don't really think about how woundedness creates this emotion. But I want to I look at what Stephen Stosny said. Stephen Stosny said, to feel resentment, anger, or an aggressive impulse, you have to be hurt or fear that you will be hurt. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road. I believe a lot of reason why there's so much anger in our world today, and men, we have a, we have a difficult time recognizing it. Did you know that? If somebody would say, are you angry? And most of you would say, no, I'm not. I'm just a little frustrated. <laughs> You know, frustration is actually a form of anger. But if you are wounded, if you have been hurt in your life, if you are being hurt currently, what is the one thing that you're going to do? Protect yourself from getting hurt again. And so woundedness, when there's emptiness, when something isn't there, like, like affirmation and appreciation and all of those things, and many of us have probably, if you look at your childhood, if you look at where you come from, there is a lot of people that grew up in abusive backgrounds, uh, addicted backgrounds, alcoholics, uh, drug addictions. You've got a lot of different things. In other words, our needs aren't being met, and God is seeing that. And our woundedness will raise the level of our anger. And that plays out a lot in domestic violence, I think. Because what happens is when you're wounded and you don't, and you don't feel loved, and you don't feel cherished, what is going to happen? You're going, to, you're going to control the person that could love you and give you what you need. And when and she tends to react to that, what do you tend to get? More angry because it comes across as a wound. So woundedness is important. Number four is fear. Fear has an association with woundedness because if you are empty or you're wounded, what are you afraid of? You're afraid you're going to get hurt again. Okay? And that guard, that fear, will keep you... Uh, you know, from uh, experiencing freedom. Now, you remember the story of Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve were told not to eat of a certain tree. What was that tree? The tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so, when they did, something happened to them. What, did, what happened when they ate of that tree? Their eyes were open, and what did they see? Their nakedness. So, when they saw their nakedness, what did they do? They ran. When God came, they ran and then they covered themselves. So then we're talking about shame, which is number five as well. Fear and shame are kind of brothers and sisters. They kind of go together. So here's God walking in the cool of the day, and guess what? He's saying, Adam, where are you? And, and God, is, and they are saying, um, you know, we, had, we ran and hid because we were naked. And God responded by saying, who told you you were naked? I believe, and listen to me carefully, that this Genesis you know, for account, this Genesis 3 account, is absolutely at the play. <coughs> the reason why we fear, and the reason why we have shame, and the reason why we get angry is because we are covering ourselves, we're running from hurt, our own nakedness. And when God comes to us, and you're going to slay our giants, what is he looking to do? He's looking to expose that which is inside of us that he wants to take from us. I don't know about you, but I'm afraid of light. Sometimes, you know, God, you know, we have this perception of God having a flashlight and he's shining that light on you and he's looking for something that he wants to heal, you know? But I don't believe that's the case because the Bible says God is what? Light. So when you invite God in, if he sees anything in you that is shame-based, afraid, what do you think he's going to do? He's going to eliminate, illuminate that. And of course, just like Adam and Eve, we tend to run from that and we say, no, Lord, I, I don't want to see it. Has anybody ever heard that in your life? You know what that sounds like when God's knocking on the door? And he says, I want that hurt in your life. I want whatever's going on in your life. Because it is generating the anger that is happening in your life. You see, anger goes deeper than just not getting what you want. And I think it goes to the core of who we are. And we look at shame and self-worth. That is where I see a lot of men. And women. But for men... As Stephen Stasi says, there is one thing a man is going to avoid at all costs, and that is shame. The feeling that he is a failure. The feeling that I am inadequate to meet my spouse's needs or my kid's needs or to be able to succeed. 
at whatever it is that I do in life. Stephen Sazi says, core hurts are vulnerabilities to the sense of self. The difference between feeling bad about ourselves, the difference between feeling bad, etc., to feeling bad about ourselves. So it's one thing to feel bad about something we've done, but it is another thing to feel bad about who we are. I'm here to tell you that you are a child of the living God. And if you are the child of the living God, there is nobody that can take that away from you. There isn't no hurt that you cannot overcome. There isn't anything that you can't heal, that God can't heal in you. And when we don't heal that, and it governs us, we run, we hide, we cover ourselves, and guess what the resulting emotion seems to be? Anger. You understand where I'm coming from? It's more than just, Johnny took my truck on the playground and I got mad and hit him. Because I think when you look at the depth of where anger is in our society today, we are seeing some deep-seated stuff. Because people don't know who they are. And you know what I'm talking about, because if you knew who you were in Christ, guess what happens? I become happy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And so that becomes the central focus. So those are, are kind of the, the basis of some of the, uh, the uh, causes. Now I want to take a look at the power of anger. Because I don't know if you know it, but power, anger has power, doesn't it? Has anybody ever got angry in this room? Do you know that it feels like energy? Have you ever felt what anger looks like? It is an, ang it is an energy that can tear us apart. But here's the power of anger. There's three good things I want to list and then seven bad things. So there's some good about anger. Number one, it mobilizes against injustice and evil. You need to be able to get angry in order to resist the devil. You've got to be able to say, I am not letting anybody attack my family. You see, if somebody came to your house and started to rob you or hurt or harm your family, what are you going to be? Angry. Now, what is the purpose of that anger? It motivates us. It motivates us to protect. Okay? So it mobilizes against injustice and evil, and there's plenty of evil and injustice in the world today. But God, again, wants us to be able to lie, manage it. Number two, it protects us and our families from harm. All right? So that's a positive thing. And number three, it helps to set boundary. Does anybody know what a boundary is? If I come over and smack you in the face, and you don't ever tell me to stop, I have license to keep doing it, don't I? Yeah. So a boundary says what? I have the ability to protect myself. Stop doing it. Okay? So see, when you get angry, uh, you know, anger really is an indication that something's wrong in the soul, isn't it? Has anybody ever had a fever? Do you know what a fever does? Yes. <laughs> fever indicates what? There is something deeper wrong with the body, right? So if you treat the fever, but you don't ever treat the reason why the fever is there, you don't actually reach the real issue. And I think the same thing happens with our emotions. Emotions like the fever of the soul. When something goes wrong in the soul, guess what happens? You get emotion. And that emotion is what we try to deal with. We say, oh, I can't be angry. I try to suck it up, and I'm just going to count to 10, and I'm not going to get angry. But guess what we're ignoring? The reason it's there. The real reason. I am a firm believer that anger is not a primary emotion. It is not the only issue that is going on. Because I think anger comes from something else that resides in the soul. We've talked about a few of those. We've talked about woundedness and fear and shame. So boundaries will help us to even understand what may be deeper inside of us that keeps us. But you know, there are some bad, uh, there's bad power that anger has. And there's a lot of them because the enemy will come in. Remember what Ephesians 4 26 says? Do not give the devil a foothold. Well, let me tell you how he can get a foothold. Number one, it fuels unforgiveness. Resentment will come from our core hurts. Whenever you are hurt, and then we add that to blame, which is the form of resentment, isn't it? Because so many times when we get angry, the first thing we do is we don't look outside of us. We don't look inside of us, I should say. We look outside of us to find out what's making us mad. You know it's kind of a uh, misnomer that people can make you angry? Did you know that nobody can make you angry? You choose to become angry. That's why I, I love Tim LaHaye. Tim LaHaye wrote, anger is a choice. And so if it is a choice, 
Your spouse can't make you mad. Your kids can't make you mad. But why? They do. I am mad because she made me mad. That's not true. You have chosen, chosen to react a certain way to a hurt that made you experience anger. In that anger, you tend to what? React to it. God has power in us. If we stand on his definition of who we are, guess what? Even though we get frustrated and we get angry at people, we can still handle it the right way. Staying calm in the midst of that anger. So unforgiveness is important when we're we'll talking about that. Number two, it causes spiritual decline. Because when you're angry, guess what you're doing? You're, when you're shame-based and you are afraid of getting hurt again, what are you doing? You're, you're moving away from God. Because now it makes you feel guilty. Self-protection. Number three, self-protection. You know what self-protection is? If, uh, if you're hurt in a certain area, guess what you're going to do? Pull back. You're, going to be, you're going to pull back. So if Joe has a broken arm, and I come along and I, I rush in, what's he going to do? He's going to, he's going to defend it. Why? Why? Because he doesn't want to get hurt again. He knows that that's a wound that is there. But so he can get mad if I keep doing it, right? Oh. You know, like, I'm going to punch you right there, you know? And so self-protection. But a lot of times, folks, self-protection gets distorted. Because now, when I am wounded deep within the heart, guess what's, guess what's going to happen? I protect myself from intimacy. From closeness, I protect myself from further hurt by pushing people away. And that's what I see in chronic anger. I, I see a lot of people that have a lot of anger inside of them, and what it is is a self-protection. I keep you at bay. I keep you at a distance so you don't have to hurt me. And you have belief in their place of God. Then, yeah, then you start blaming God because of the hurt. Or start blaming God because of the hurt that you're getting after you've been hurt the first time. But it's a long string. Folks, I deal with people all the time that have woundedness that is very, very, very deep. And sometimes we don't even realize what we're reacting to. So if you're a person that reacts to a lot of things, boom, 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 boom. Look inside. We're going to talk about that. Number four, it destroys relationships. Obviously, anger doesn't work in a marriage. It doesn't work in a relationship. It doesn't work with your kids. It doesn't work on a chronic level, okay? It destroys it. But it, when it destroys it, it also what? Isolates us. You know, you know what's fascinating to me about human nature? We are afraid of rejection, but then we act in a way that causes people to reject us. Isn't that crazy? And so we have to kind of manage those emotions so that we invite people in. Because I've got to tell you, God's going to allow your spouse, your friend, your kids, your boss to test you. Because he's the one that's bringing it up. Could God be the one that is allowing things to happen so he can... Can you, can you imagine? I mean, he motivates my wife nasty? No. Uh -oh. No. But guess what? God can use whatever nastiness you define to find out what's inside of you. Because if you can love her regardless of that, because God demonstrated his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, he made the first move. What better example for us than to even curb anybody's nastiness. Remember Proverbs 15, 1? A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. What is our typical response when somebody attacks us? Harsh words. <laughs> All right? So, that, so that's important. So it destroys relationships. Number five, it creates depression. You know, um, I, I love what Dr. Minot de Meyer said about anger. He's, but he said the definition of depression, I should say. The definition of depression is anger turned inward. So you hold in anger for a prolonged period of time, it will create depression because of what you're dealing with. Number six, it masks the real issues. And we kind of talked about that a little bit and how it tends to mask what's really going on inside of you. Anger is the primary emotion that hides a secondary hurt. Inside of us, there's a secondary hurt that is actually creating the primary emotion. That's why I believe in this society, everybody's getting angry. Because we're really not dealing with the core issues that are going on. Folks, when it comes to these shootings that are going on in society, and every time you see one, whether it be in school, churches, or whatever, what is the media's first response to it? We've got to do gun control. We've got to have gun control. 
Yeah, that's like cutting off our fist if we're punching somebody. That's not the problem. The problem is the heart. The anger problem doesn't come from the fact that we're angry. It comes from the fact that we're wounded inside. And something's going on, and we've got to deal with it. Until a society starts to deal with why it is that we are angry, we're never going to get the point. Oh, by the way, i got to say this too. If you remove God from a society, can you expect evil to grow? And that evil will cause the devil to get a foothold, and in your anger, we end up sinning. Is the church susceptible to that as well? Well, I, I would submit to you that the church is actually a lot more vulnerable to it because we are the ones that Satan's attacking. He's already got the world. He's already got their attention. <clears throat> He's going to attack us because he doesn't like who we are in Christ. So we, are, we as, as believers have to be diligent more and more. And number seven, it tears apart the body. It tears apart the body. i got, I got to share this with you. Uh, the American Psychological Association did a couple of studies they studied 12,986 adults over a three-year period, and they concluded this, that there is a two to three times increased risk of coronary events in people with normal blood pressure, but with high anger. You can have normal blood pressure, but if you have high anger and you have a chronic anger problem, you have a two to three times more chance of having a coronary event in your life. Okay? Another study was done where 4,083 adults were studied for 12, 10 to 15 years, and what they found is those who were lowest in anger control, those that got angry the most, had the highest risk of fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events. Experts concluded that the high trait anger, chronic hostility, anger and express, anger expression, acute anger episodes can lead to new or reoccurring cardiovascular disease. In other words, what is happening when you get angry? Your body is reacting. All right. Remember we are talking about the fact that anger is energy? John Gottman has said this one time. Now, how many of you, when you are angry, you end up fighting with your wife or your spouse or your, or your uh, kids and, you know, people in your life? When you're angry, you actually fight. Has anybody ever been in a, in a fight for, like, two, three hours? It's a waste of time. Okay? But listen to me carefully. John Gottman shared this with me before. He says this, and I kind of believe him. He says, when you are angry, if your heart rate increases to more than 100 beats per minute, you are now in a fight or flight mode. When you're in a fight or flight mode, what happens to you? You lose the ability to listen and perceive things correctly. So in other words, your brain is shutting down its ability to listen and to perceive. And so when you're angry and your heart rate is up, way past 100 beats per minute because you are venting and you're trying to get your, your spouse or kids or boss or somebody to see your point, guess what's happening? When they're talking back to you, you can't perceive things now because your energy is there tearing up the body. And you let that go for an extended period of time, guess what's going to happen? It will tear you apart. And then, of course, what does it do? It creates depression by lowering serotonin levels. All right. Does anybody have any questions so far? Uh, you're not supposed to ever get angry, and as a good Christian man, you're never supposed to like get upset, yell, scream, or act crazy. I mean, I don't know. Like, it's supposed to. Yes, yeah. That's that's like she spent a thousand dollars on something. Do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember what we just read in Ephesians four twenty six? In your anger, do not what sin. Sin. So we never said it was never appropriate to get angry because the things are going to make us mad. It isn't the emotion itself, it's how we what? Yeah. Yeah. Handle it. Alright? That's it important like to understand. Little, too much little on the goody two shoes side. Was Jesus a goody two shoes? No, but like, like I'm, I'm, uh, 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 I'm mad. I'm, uh, I'm able to be beat up on my spouse or, or somebody. But you have other, I, don't, I don't react. There, there are other issues going on than, than just the anger management. Uh, now you've got to talk about setting boundaries and all that sort of stuff. So. Yeah. Alright. Let's talk about the last thing we're going to talk about today, which is going to be probably the rest of the session here, is overcoming it. Standing calm, restoring calm in our lives. All right? And there are four words I want us to look at. Recognize, regulate, release, and renew. This is going to be the crux of, of our session today. Is how do we deal? We just kind of understand a little bit about the anger. Now, how do we work, how do we deal with it when we are angry? All right. And so here's where we're going to bring up the word. So you got your Bibles ready. All right. 
the first thing we need to do is to recognize that we are angry. There's so many times that people, somebody will come up to you and say, are you mad? And guess what we're going to say? No, I'm not angry. Because you don't even recognize it. Once again, if you are absolutely starting to get anger in that, in that uh, heartbeat goes above 100 beats a minute, guess what? You don't even have the ability to see it yourself. All you're seeing is somebody else getting angry at you. All right? So the first thing we gotta do is recognize it. In other words, be aware and acknowledge that feelings of anger exist. That's the only way you're gonna be able to restore calm. Because if you don't recognize it, you will be in trouble. Now, has anybody here ever just gotten, just flared up with rage right off the bat? You go to zero to 60 in 2.4 seconds. You don't have the ability in that case to start recognizing what's actually causing you. But let me ask you this question. It's an interesting question. Is, do we, is that a pattern that is natural in us, or is this something that develops? Can we find ourselves getting frustrated long before we go to that rage? Can we see the signs coming before they come of that rage? Something wells up inside. Yeah, you can, you can start sensing something. Because mostly, people are going to start agitating you, and you're going to start sensing a little bit of irritation. All right? And, and then you know what your trigger is, right? You know what triggers you. You know what your buttons are. And so in order to do that, in order to be aware and acknowledge our feelings, we've got to be able to step back and say, okay, what does God want me to do? To kind of look at it honestly. Because the second point here is that we need to be aware of internal primary emotions. The internal primary emotions, these are the ones that happen. This is the emotions. These are the wounds. These are the things that happen inside of us that generate the anger that we have. In Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24, it has a prayer here that is very, very important. It says this, Search my wife, O God, and know her heart. <laughs> Test her and know her anxious thoughts. See if there's any offense away within her. Hey, that's a good, that's a good prayer, isn't it? No, that, I, that isn't what it says, right? Search my friend. Search everybody else. Search everybody that's causing me to be angry but me. But here's the prayer I challenge you to, to uh, say. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. <clears throat> See if there's any offensive way within me. Oh my goodness, I don't want to do that because there is no offensive way. It's not me. It's, it's the other person. I don't have an offensive part of me. It's the other person that's causing me to do it. <laughs> do you understand that that's kind of a misnomer to if, you, if you're saying that somebody else caused something inside of me, then you actually have it inside of you. You ever heard that thing when you point at somebody, you got four fingers pointing back at you? Mm -hmm. You know? But see, when God, when we go and complain to God about our spouse or our friend or our work co-workers or our boss, guess what God is going to do? He's going to look within ourselves and say, how are you dealing with it? I'll take care of that. But how are you dealing with it? Okay. Do you know how God does it too? He kind of squeezes us. Has anybody been squeezed before? I like Robert McGee's analogy. He says, if you squeeze a toothpaste tube, what comes out of it? <laughs> toothpaste. Why does toothpaste come out of a toothpaste tube when you squeeze it? Because that's what's in it. That's what's inside. That's what's inside. When we're squeezed, what comes out of us? What's in us? So is it possible that God could use other circumstances, other people, to squeeze us because he wants us to heal or recognize something that's going on inside of us? Is that possible? Can God use any circumstance in your life to teach you how to be calm in the midst of any circumstance? Can God use any circumstance in your life? That's the primary the emotions inside. He will expose the shame. He'll expose the fear. He'll expose our woundedness. He'll expose what's going on inside of us so that we can actually allow him to heal us. And when he heals us, we become whole. When we become whole, guess what happens to us? We become stable. And we're not going to react as much anymore. Amen? The third thing here is evaluate and adjust expectations. Evaluate and adjust expectations. James 4.1 is the key. If you have your Bible, James 4.1, and I'll read it. It's a very... Uh, a very familiar portion of scripture. This is key because I believe that God holds the answer to every anger issue we have in this verse. In these verses. Here is what it says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? 
Isn't that a good question? What causes fights and quarrels among you? And what does he do? He answers the question with a question. question. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Well, that's interesting. You desire, but do not have, so you kill. Now, the word kill there isn't actually murder. Because Jesus was saying that if you are, if you have anger in your heart, you already commit murder in a sense. Okay? Because it's the soul. It's, it's murdering the character. It's, it's, you are doing something to them in your head. All right? So basically, what causes fights and quarrels among us? Does it not come because we're not getting what we want? You see what I'm saying? Well, not me. You see what God is saying? That's the interesting thing about starting to understand how to stand calm. Because if we realize that when I get mad, something's boiling inside of me. I don't care who's doing it. My wife will do a really good job at that. She will really do a good job. In fact, I would submit that because I came from, a, you know, I come from woundedness myself and my background, when she gets angry, I feel like she's angry at me, so I'll get angry at her because she's not supposed to be angry with me because I didn't do anything wrong. And then we stop, we stop talking for three days, and we come back and finally deal with it and find out I didn't, I, did, I missed it. It wasn't what I was, it wasn't what she was angry, so I couldn't, shouldn't, didn't have to be angry. This was early on in the marriage, and I had to learn something that whenever she was mad, it was triggering something inside of me. The wounds, the inadequacy, the feeling like a failure, that when she is unhappy, I felt like I wasn't doing what I needed to do to make her happy. Now that's a deep thought, but I had to come to that realization, that anger, and the reason for anger goes that deep. It's something trapped in our soul, and that's why God comes along. Because guess what he's going to do? He's going to open the door, and he's going to want us to look at why it is. Is it not come from the desires that battle within you? All right? So evaluate and adjust expectations. So recognizing it is the first step. Very, very important. Number two is to regulate. You know what regulate means? Huh? Regulate yeah. anger? Regulate. What does the word mean? Regulate. Control. To control. To master said emotion. This, you know, you said it right. I mean, this is the hardest part of it. Recognizing it is one thing, but mastering it and regulating it is another. Do you remember the story of Cain? Adam and Eve had kids. And the two, the two brothers that came out were Cain and Abel. And you know the famous story. It's like Abel sacrifices were more acceptable to God. And so Cain was pretty happy with that. So he went and adjusted himself. And, you know, he got the sacrifices that were actually good. And him and Abel worked together really good. Yeah, it didn't happen that way, right? So Cain gets angry. And God recognizes it. And let me, let me share with you in Genesis 4, verses 6 to 7, what it says. It says, Then the Lord said to Cain, very interesting, Why are you angry, and why is your face downcast? God recognized something. It's interesting, those two questions. And not just why are you angry, but why is your face downcast? In other words, there is a deeper reason why you're angry. Tell me about it, Cain. All right? If you do what is right, you will, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. This is God's advice to Cain. You must rule over it. In the New Living Translation, it says, you will, be, you will be accepted if you do what is right, but if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must master, you must subdue it and be its master. That's some pretty powerful words. You know who's saying this to Cain? God. You know why God is saying it to Cain? Because he sees that impulse about ready to strike. Alright? Now why didn't why didn't Cain just intervene? I mean, why didn't God just intervene and just shut Cain down from killing Abel? Unfortunately, God allows things to happen because he put us in this world to make the decisions that we need to make. But not all decisions are good. In the message, it says, God spoke to Cain, why this tantrum? Why the sulking? If you do well, won't you be accepted? 
And if you don't do well, sin is lying in wait for you, ready to pounce. It's out to get you. You've got to master it. I just think that is so powerful. Because what is he saying to us as a church today? What could God be saying? Whatever it is that's causing you to be angry, it is the motive inside of you that I'm really looking at. Because the motive, it means the anger is mastering you. You've got to master it. What's the difference between mastering and hiding? Well, well hiding, as you could say, I mastered it if I counted the 10 backwards or whatever. Well, yeah. If, you, if you're mastering it, then what you're doing is you're actually resolving it in your head. In actuality, what, what God is saying to Cain, just do what is right. Make your sacrifices like Abel, and you'll be accepted. Okay? Because I think we're really good at hiders, aren't we? Because if you're suppressing your anger, guess, where, guess what happens the next time you have that same trigger? It's going to come out worse. So hiding it makes it worse. Mastering it says, I'm going to check my expectations. I'm going to find out what is it that I'm, I'm, I'm not getting that I really need. And I'm going to allow God to start ministering peace to me. That's what it really means to master it. What Cain should have done is said, you know what, Lord? Thank you for telling me how I can be accepted. Now I'm going to rest in that. I'm going to do what is right. And I'm not going to let sin reign in my, in my, uh, in my body and cause me to react. All right? Everybody understand that. Master your impulse. Impulse control is the single worst thing I think that's happening in our country and in our world today. Because now you've got road rage issues that all you have to do is go down the road and you've seen it. There was a story in one state where somebody chased somebody down for several miles and then ended up pulling out a gun and shooting them and killing them. So you, you're like, wait a minute, somebody just made me mad. Now I'm staying mad long enough to chase you down. You talk about somebody that doesn't master the impulse. <laughs> because the most dangerous thing is that when anger gets to a mind that is kind of like a little disturbed, what's going to happen? That anger is going to get a lot more powerful. Rational minds mastering the impulse is absolutely important. Because you're going to be mad. I guarantee you, somewhere today, tomorrow, or this week, something's going to try you, and you're going to get mad at somebody. And God wants it's, us to it's learn what I'm how doing. to control. I'm letting them control my emotions. Mm -hmm. Something that's outside of me. Yep. Right. Yep. So if I allow it to happen, then I'm saying you're you, you're controlling my emotions. You're controlling me. Which is really, which is really a powerful point because if you think about it, if you if you are chronically angry at one person, that person does have control over you. Yeah. And God was actually saying to Cain, "Why are you allowing Abel to control you? It isn't about what Abel's sacrifice is. It's about what you do." And let me tell you what you can do to calm that anger down. See, for some reason, he, he saw Abel as the threat. So what did he end up doing? He went and killed his brother. All right? And you know the story. But then God, God protected Cain too. Mm -hmm. That helps him out. Yep. All right, so mastery impulses. Secondly, we need to change our defensive posture to a proactive one. It is time to stop the defensive posture. We get so defensive in our society, right? You know what defensiveness is? We get hurt, we're so sensitive, we allow people to you know, irritate us that quickly. And it, is it fair for me to say that the church is actually more sensitive these days? I've seen more Christians so sensitive that if you say something the wrong way, they're, they're getting angry with you. It's like we should be the, we should be the leaders in God's calm in our lives. You see, it's not about what is happening to us, folks. It is about how we handle it and the love of Christ coming out in us. Jesus was never angry when he got attacked, personally. That, to me, is, is one of the most powerful things. He went to trial. He was un, unrighteously crucified. He was accused for no reason whatsoever. And yet he didn't sin because he didn't get angry. And even on the cross, in the midst of his pain, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That's crazy. Can we, can we actually do that? That's, that's mm -hmm. a hard thing to do. Just one quick thing about Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, he was a nonviolent practice. Well, he really did practice that, because he was on a march down in Alabama or someplace, and he's walking with the people. Some guy came up and punched him right in the face, almost knocked him, knocked him to the ground. He just got up, right? They didn't want him to keep on walking. I was like, damn. 
because he knew who he was. <laughs> See, I would submit to you the reason why Jesus didn't get angry is because he knew who he was. And that is a very powerful thing to think about because if he knew who he was, he knew what his mission was, he knew he was going to get abused. He knew it. But he chose not to give in because that would have allowed the enemy to get a foothold. Alright? Yeah. So change your defensive posture to a proactive one. James 1, 19 and 20. Really good verse to live by. It says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to become angry. No. <laughs> oh, that's, no, that's, that's the reverse version. The standard reverse version. What does it say? Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. It didn't say not to become angry, it said slow. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Wow. So maybe it's important to be able to listen to resolve some of those impulses inside of us. Because most of the times when we're angry, we are just reacting to whatever's going on inside of us. And we're not listening to what the other person is really saying. And besides, if God has sent somebody to you to knock on your door, to squeeze you, Maybe we should say, thank you for getting angry with me today because I know what God's going to work on me now. It's really hard. <laughs> Isn't anger like a form of revenge? I want to get back with you. Well, anger leads to revenge. That's the problem. Like you That's heard me? Heard Uncontrolled me. anger will lead to revenge. <laughs> Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. All right? So learn to be at peace. All right, number three is release. God wants us to release it. Now this is different from hiding. This is different from hiding. Release is allowing God to work in you through any circumstance. Whatever is happening to you, whatever is going on in your life, even if it is a negative circumstance, can we believe that God will allow things to go in our lives to perfect us? James, James 1, 2, 4 says, Consider it pure joy whenever you face what? Trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work. So you mature and complete, not lacking anything. So really, adversity, trials, are designed to perfect us. And if we get mad at people or situations that give us trials, we can't be perfected. We're stuck in the mode of anger. And we're not allowing God to perfect us. So really, in a sense, releasing is allowing God to work in you no matter what the circumstances say. All right? But most importantly, we can't leave here without talking about this. Release the power of forgiveness. Because it is the only thing that is going to release you from the chronic anger that's inside of us, the resentment that builds up over the course of time. And realizing that God is the one that heals the soul, we are the one that forgives. This is, I would submit to us that this is a very hard thing to do. And it is absolutely impossible to do if you try to do it in the flesh. If you try to forgive in the flesh, it, is, it will not happen. You need a spiritual power inside of you that says, Lord, you're going to have to help me with this. And here's, so there's three scriptures I want us to focus on. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, it says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's the important part of it, I want you to hear. Forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you. You have a model. You forgive each other the same way that Christ forgave you. It's repeated again in Colossians 3, verses 12 and 13. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has agreements against someone. <laughs> Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as what? The Lord forgave you. All right, so twice in Scripture, Paul is saying, I want you to forgive as God forgave you. Now, does anybody know how God forgave you? By dying on the cross for us? Completely. God demonstrated his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? Let me show you the model. 
If you have your Bible, you've got to go with me to Psalm 103. I want you to see this. Psalm 103. I won't read it until you're there. Because I want you to see how God forgives us. And I believe that, and when I teach, you know, forgiveness, this is one of the verses, the three or four verses here, that I always will get them to look at. Memorize these four verses. Because this is how God forgave you. All right? Very powerful. Here's what it says in Psalm 103, verse 8 to 12. It says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Do you realize that God does not treat you as your sins deserve to be treated? His forgiveness goes way deeper than even what we've done. He understands who we are. It isn't about who, it isn't about what we've done in Christ, it is about who we are. That's why he's able to separate the sin from the sinner. So he does not treat us as our sins deserve. We deserve to be treated with hell because we reject Christ with our behavior. But he doesn't treat us that way. It says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, when I read this one time in the science school class, I had a pilot in the class, and, and he said something very, very powerful. He says, when you are flying in an airplane, if you go north, you'll eventually go south, because you'll cross the North Pole, and you'll go south. But if you go east, you will never go west. Well, think about that. When God removes the sins from us, it is gone greater distances than we think, but we hold on to it. See, we're the ones. The brain is a, is a terrible thing. It must be stopped. Because we're the ones that hold on to our weaknesses, our inadequacies, our woundedness, our resentments, our bitterness. So if you look at Psalm 103, and it says in Scripture to forgive as the Lord forgave you, then let me read this from our perspective. It says we should be compassionate and gracious. We should be slow to anger, abounding in love. We should not always accuse, nor should we harbor our anger forever. Because what the devil gets a what? Foothold. We should not treat each other as their sins deserve, nor should we repay them according to their iniquities against us. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great our love should be for other people. And as far as the east is from the west, so far we should remove their transgressions. Isn't that interesting? If you look at the fact that we're supposed to forgive in the way that God forgave us, and I look at this as a model of it, can you realize the next time that you forgive somebody, you can't bring it back up again. Forgiveness in its true sense is erasing the debt no longer. Now, will that cause us to stand calm? Even in the face of adversity? Even when my wife continues to do the wrong things, even when my kids do the wrong things, my coworker, anybody in your life, isn't that powerful enough to stand and cause us to stand, right? It's further back. It's behind you right now. It's you. No, I'm mad. <laughs> I'm really angry. Does everybody understand you? I can get mad. You got a spare set? What? Mad at the TV, right? Get technical on me, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I can get angry, and I'm about to be angry at you. <laughs> but I have to forgive you, and I cast my your sin as far as the east is from the west. So. Yeah. All right, does everybody understand about that with forgiveness? This is, it's a very short lesson. You can I could teach this for months. This thing about forgiveness, and I'm not even giving you a chance to even ask any questions about it. But forgiveness is absolutely powerful. Now, the last thing before we close is we need to renew. What is renewing? It is solidifying who we are in Christ. Because the real, true culprit in a chronic anger issue, in my opinion, is shame. It is not knowing who we are. And if you allow God to heal you of hurts, heal God, God allow God's healing to bind up your wounds. Because he has come to what? To bind up broken hearts. So folks, if you are whole and you are healing, and you're allowing God to work in your life, guess what? You don't have to, you don't have to be angry. You don't have to be an angry person. 
but you can stand calm in the midst of adversity. You can stand calm in any circumstance that is going to come your way. Because we're understanding that probably the core of what's going on inside of us is already there. And God wants to bring it up. It's kind of a different way of looking at anger management, isn't it? It's less about, oh, I've got to count to ten, and i gotta, I got to suck it up, i got to just walk away. It is actually looking inward and saying, Lord, what is it that's generating this in my life? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Amen? Like the Lord, what are you trying to teach? Yeah. How are you squeezing me today? Because what causes fights and quarrels among you? Does it not come from the desires that what? Battle within you. I cannot say to Dorothy, you're making me mad. Well, I wish I could sometimes. Oh, I she that. Because she does some things that makes me angry. But then God reminds us, this is how you're supposed to deal with it. All right? So let's pray. Let's pray today. Hallelujah. Lord, we just come before you today. We are grateful for your word. We're grateful, Lord, that you are the one that can set us free. You're the one that can heal us in the deepest parts of our soul. You're the one that can make us whole so that we can look at life from a different angle. No longer are we going to look at life through our woundedness. Now we look at it through the restoration, the ability for you to heal the heart, to heal the mind, to heal the soul, so that whatever happens to us today, we look at it from a totally different perspective. And that causes us to have that slow-to-anger response. So calm us all. Help us to stay calm in you. Thank you for this opportunity today. Thank you for the pastor's message. Lord, it just it works together, Lord. Because if anger is our giant, then this is what we need to do. To look inside and ask us, where is that power coming from? And then work it enough to reduce its power. And the power of Christ increases inside of us. So thank you for everyone here. Watch us as we, as we travel home, we pray today. In Jesus' name. God bless you. You're dismissed today.